to this third lecture in the South Africa series. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the Umfakane. The Umfakane was a very significant and somewhat controversial period in South African history. It was significant because it adversely affected pretty much all the people we spoke about in the previous lecture. And it's controversial because there are disagreements about how it started, the extent of which it uh, spread across the South African area, and the effects of it. Let me start by saying a couple of things about the word itself. Emphakane is said to mean the crushing or the scattering or according to some sources it comes from Horsa words meaning becoming thin from hunger or starving intruders. So obviously it's conjuring up ideas such as upheaval, famine, dispersal, refugees and ultimately death and destruction. The second thing to say about the word itself is that while emphakane seems to be the more generally accepted word to describe this phenomenon, the Sutu people had their own word or words in difkane or lifkane. Now I'm not certain whether this was simply a matter of different tribal terminology or whether the Sutu words conjured up something to represent their own experience which was quite different to the experience of the people on the lowlands. Several sources put down the Mfakane to the expansionist militaristic policies of Shaka in conquering tribes and pushing people out of their traditional areas and consequently causing a chain reaction. Perhaps better informed sources attribute it to a number of factors including crippling drought, the search for food, as well as escaping the persecution of neighbouring tribes. Some of the factors included in the causes of the Mfakane are the increased density of the population in that coastal region between the Drakensberg and the Natal coastline. There was very little geographic opportunities for expansion with the Drakensberg to the west the Zulus to the north and the Horsa to the south. Another factor was the increased tendency for people to become settled rather than nomadic. This came about partly because of competition for land and partly because the Portuguese had introduced corn into Mozambique and as that spread further south it changed agricultural practices. Corn was more productive but it required more water and more tending and therefore people tended to stay on their land for a lot longer. Another factor was a crippling drought that hit the whole land in the first decade of the 1800s. Then there was the significant wars between the Ndwandwe under Zwide, which we have learnt about on the one hand, and the Mtetwa under Dingisweo on the other. Now, while we touched on this in the former lecture, you may not have appreciated the extent to which these wars impacted on a whole lot of tribes in that area south of the Pongola River and north of the Jugela River. Now, we also learned in the previous lecture about two tribes, the Nguanwe and the Halubi, which had nestled themselves into the foothills of the Dragonsberg. They had actually been pushed out of the Zululand area because of the warring tribes there. As part of the Mtetwa expansion at this time, and we're talking about 1817 by now, Dingiswayo and Shaka decided that that Matawane's Ngwanwa people should be taken out, given their increased power. Matawane got wind of this and he did a couple of things. First of all, he shunted his cattle off to the Alubi king, Mtimkulu. Then he made a tactical concession to Dingisweo. 
and Dinga Sueo, somewhat to Shaka's disgust, let Matawane off with most of his tribe still intact. Now a couple of things happened in quick, in quick succession after that. The Hulubu king, Mtimkulu, refused to give Matawane's cattle back to him. And pretty much at the same time, Zuides and Duanwe attacked Matawana. Now, the significant thing here was that usually when a tribe attacked another tribe, they stole some of its cattle and they left them with resources and, and some sort of survivable power. However, on this occasion, Zuide left Matawana and his tribe with absolutely no resources whatsoever. Matawane was left with only one practicable option. He had to attack the Hulubi, get back his cattle and take some of theirs, if not all of theirs, in order to survive. And he did this with a ferocity that came with desperation for survival. The Hulubi, meanwhile, had no option but to retreat further up the Drakensberg, where they encountered somewhat surprised Sutu tribes. The Nguane followed them up and eventually a battle between the two resulted in the Hulubi being dispersed. To complicate the issue further, there was a large Sutu clan called the Tlokwa. It was under the leadership of a female chieftain, a femme fatale if ever there was one, called Mantatisi. She led a veritable horde southwards on an earth-scorching campaign, being driven out initially by Inguanwe under Matawane. Her campaign south was stopped rather incongruously by a very small clan, but to whose assistance had come a band of Greekers. Now, there weren't many of them, and they weren't well armed, but the Greekers true to their ancestry, were considered to be excellent horsemen and not too bad with a rifle. They were able to halt the Mantati horde, as history would come to call them. They couldn't take them head on, there were too many, but they could harass them sufficiently that eventually the horde turned back and limped northwards. As they did so, they encountered a small Sutu clan under the leadership of a very young Moshwe Shwe, now, Meshwe Shwe wanted nothing to do with the rampaging and, and pillaging that had been taking place. So he took his rather small clan, about a couple of thousand people, and headed into the western foothills of the Drakensberg. There he discovered a strange looking mountain with a plateau on top. It was called the Mountain of the Night, Tabu Bosu or something similar to that. It's now a World Heritage Site. We will actually pass by close to it as we skirt or go through Maseru, the capital of Lesotho. We may even have the chance to hike it. It's said to be a very um, exciting experience. But back to the story. My good friend here, Ronald Morris, describes Moshwe uh, Shwe on his plateau as one island of sanity in a sea of madness. Meanwhile, the Mantati horde continued to harass Moshwe Shwe for some years until Moshwe Shwe was strong enough in the end to completely eliminate it. Matawane also was harassing Moshwe Shwe. Moshwe Shwe called in help from Shaka and Matawane was eventually driven further south until he completely ran out of puff. By this stage, Dingane had taken over the Zulu Empire and Dingane called on Matawane to come visit him. He did. He had no option. It's said that Dingane pondered his future, that is Matawane's future, for a while and then ceremoniously, or maybe unceremoniously, gouged his eyes out and killed him by driving stakes up his nostrils. 
Perhaps that was the origin of the saying that don't let some things get up your nose. By this time, the Imphicane had pretty much run its course. Morris's final summing up, I shall read for you. While Shaka was certainly responsible for the havoc on the coastal strip, he had little enough to do with the destruction in the interior. The onus here falls on Zuide, Matawane and Imtumkulu. That is, of course, the Ndwanwe, the Nguane and the Lubi. Perhaps he should have also added our good friend Manatisi and her Matatiti horde. That is uh, my short summary of the Mfakane.